Hello everybody. Very warm welcome to our common talk at the AWS reInvent about developing a platform for software-defined vehicles. With me on stage is Thorsten Reitemeyer from AWS. My name is Martin Stamm. I'm from Continental Automotive and we are very happy to give you a short overview on the evolution of our platform for the software inside vehicles. Let me give you a first overview how software systems are changing in automotive. As you might know and recognize, your vehicles are going to become increasingly intelligent. So they learn how to drive themselves. They learn how to park autonomously. And the functions which are controlled by software are growing in, uh, steadily from now approximately 10% until 40% in 2030. There's also a strong growth in the overall market for software and electrical components in the vehicle. And there is as well a strong growth in sales of software in automotive. And additionally, a large portion of the innovations already come right now from software and electronics in the automotive area. So we have to recognize that software plays really an important part in the vehicles and in the automotive market. This also goes in line with the computing power which is built into the vehicles. So we are expecting a high increase of high, higher computing power in the single vehicle within the next 10 years. And of course, that will not end in 2030. It's going beyond that. This also goes in line with significant changes in the way the vehicle is built from the electronic units. So um, if you look at the current electronic architecture of a vehicle, that is all the computing nodes which are inside the vehicle, they have approximately roughly 100 electronic control units inside such a modern vehicle and all the com uh, compute units have a very limited computing power uh, and have dedicated functions. Pretty much you can imagine like you have a single compute uh, unit doing nothing else than processing word and another compute unit doing nothing else than processing PowerPoints. Very limited power, very dedicated functions. We have lots of wires in the car. And of course, that also uh, puts some high impediments when it comes to connectivity, to security, and to update of functions. Uh, looking at what is currently already happening is we see a highest con consolidation of those uh, distributed and patchwork architecture towards, uh, now you have to take the term very uh, automotive-like high-performance computers. Of course, that is not what Amazon builds in their uh, clusters, but it's something which has the key performance of a modern mobile phone. So the current vehicle architectures are more function-defined architectures with a single-digit number of high-performance computers. 
And uh, all those are more defined by the software functions. They have a clear abstraction from the hardware. We expect also that the wires of the vehicles are reduced significant. And of course, modern vehicles are more or less always connected. And it, they behave also like connected devices, which means functions are distributed across cloud and vehicle in the end. So also from the user uh, expectation point of view, the users expect to get a vehicle which behaves like a smart device. Here you can see a refactored version of a vehicle architecture with uh, two vehicle computer which have a high performance in terms of embedded performance. Then we have several zonal compute units which are um, installed in order to handle low latency demands of sensors and actors and to, in order to handle safety demands which can not be handled by the high performance computers themselves. The basic functions of the vehicles, however, are controlled by the vehicle computers and are controlled by software. Of course, there is a dedicated connection as well into the cloud in order to have distributed functions um, together with cloud services or together with services from other vehicles. Looking at those software function-centric way of uh, deploying software into vehicles, we also get uh, into a different way on how software is treated in terms of releasing and bringing them into the vehicle. So far, hardware and software were pretty much coupled in terms of timing and in terms of release cycles. So uh, normally software is part of hardware and as soon as the car goes into production you also have a software a major software release and after the vehicle is on the road there are maybe few bug fixes but there is nothing like new functions coming into the vehicle so far this already starts now to change drastically if you look at vehicles which are released now, then you see that already you can have even function updates in your vehicle just by getting a software update. So the life cycle of the software is quite different from the life cycle of the hardware and the, of the underlying hardware. And you can expect, and that's what you have in your digital um, lifestyle anyway with the other devices you see um, that over time your vehicle will get new functions and services throughout the entire vehicle life cycle. Um, to give you an example uh, about the current status of uh, where we are now in our software and uh, high performance computing inside vehicles. Um, I just collect some experience from a recent project where we started to bring these kind of vehicle computers into production with an OEM. So with a vehicle manufacturer. So uh, looking at that, example of a current project we had 18 companies working together developing software for this single vehicle computer distributed across 13 development locations there were approximately 800 developers 
involved in that um, project um, with in Continental, and there were about approximately 600 third party and OEM developers. Um, it, the, the, the vehicle computer itself had links to 68 other different control units and um, it self contained five virtual ECUs and five di different operating systems using hypervisor technologies. Uh, let me shortly uh, talk a bit about where we come from uh, within Continental. So maybe Continental is well known from what you see uh, in the third uh, column of this picture. It's pretty well recognized uh, of producing tires. It's not so frequently recognized that Continental is one of the leading players in autonomous mobility, especially in uh, when it comes to um, the existing vehicle fleet and uh, assisted driving functions. As I've shown you before, um, Continental is the first to market with a real vehicle computer in a software-defined vehicle architecture. And we have approximately 235,000 employees and about 16,000 of it are in the software domain. I would like to talk shortly about what is currently happening in terms of how the architecture and the ecosystem changes for vehicles and for uh, electronics and software inside vehicles. Currently, what we see is that the end users of the vehicles expect really a continuous evolution of their vehicle functions. So they want to use the latest and greatest services and have something like what they know from their mobile phones or from their uh, smart home components. Of course, new services also need um, a close integration to communication uh, devices like or communication ecosystems like the cloud and like other vehicles, especially things like automated driving can largely improve if you have a vehicle to vehicle communication or a vehicle to infrastructure communication. That also puts a, a strong push towards time to market for new functions. Of course, in this entire ecosystem, it's really mandatory to be able to integrate third party services and software functions. And all this, of course, with not losing safety and security and privacy. The impact to the architecture on this uh, requirements is quite significant. So we need, of course, to decouple hardware from software and services. We need a strong centralization of compute power, and we need to separate I.O. devices from the compute. Of course, the cloud and communication integration is mandatory as well as the standardization of interfaces and platforms. That is something where I think automotive can learn a lot from consumer electronic software development. Um, the drivers of the, this activities, of course, is customer experience. Software is the main differentiator here. And of course, it's necessary to provide solutions which are able to integrate 
across the entire IoT stack. What also is essential that we have scalable platforms in terms of hardware and software and of course to have something like mature and reusable services which we can reuse. Moving one step further, if we compare to what happens inside uh, the different functions and domains. So far, as I introduced before, the compute inside the vehicle is significantly domain oriented. We talked about that, that we have a dedicated uh, computer for example for driving the cockpit and the HMI system. And we have a dedicated computer for example for driving the automated driving functions and the ADAS features. Going forward this more domain specific solutions are going to face a horizontal integration and a, word, a, a horizontal integration towards compute power and of course towards the cloud systems. And of course in line with that we also somehow will face the situation that on the same hardware platforms we see different vertical integrated full stacks which are needed to integrate it vertically uh, to reflect a sort of domain specific uh, part of the functions inside a bigger holistic compute system. Looking a bit more into the details of an architecture which we develop as a continental automotive edge platform, we see now three different essential parts of the architecture. The first part which we see is on the left bottom side, the scalable compute platform, and that is something which is more or less uh, the embedded domain of the architecture starting with a continental hardware platform, then going up hosting an automotive software platform which enables the system to run functions from different domains. So ADAS function, cockpit function, safety and motion functions, body functions, of course, also functions which use cloud services, which we have on the right side of the slide. For the cloud service function, of course, we rely heavily on the services which are already existing at our partner AWS. And we indicate only a few services of which are essential for the current status of the platform, there is of course a lot to come. So um, we started the development activities, especially focused on the simulation and validation services, means we use the cloud to simulate and validate software functions, which later on are deployed into the vehicle. On top of that, we have the DevOps workbench, which contains everything a developer needs to develop functions for the scalable compute platform or for the cloud. It contains the tool chain for generating code and binaries. It contains continuous integration and uh, continuous deployment functions, software distribution policies, um, and of course, it enables collaboration by completely basing and hosting this uh, 
kind of workbench in the cloud based on AWS services. So it's very easy to onboard uh, new uh, companies, to onboard new development partners. And of course, it needs extensive monitoring and analytics features as well during the development of the systems as during the operations of the vehicles. Um, of course, this is not a closed ecosystem and solution. Continental would never be able to develop all parts and puzzle pieces of this ecosystem on its own. It's more that you can imagine this as a framework where you can easily exchange dedicated components of this uh, architecture um, by bringing your own solution and having clear interfaces how to uh, embed them into this entire framework. Let me start with a very first use case, which we already integrated into this Continental Automotive Edge platform. The use case is that we are using the automated driving functions and especially the field operation tests which we normally do in order to uh, validate those functions like emergency brake assists and part of this validation is already heavily using the fact that it is something which we not always do with real life vehicles but we use heavy compute power in order to rerun tests. What you see in this uh, slide is a sort of infinite loop, which starts in the real world with updating service, uh, services or software, uh, in then driving the vehicles around different scenarios and do a data acquisition of the raw sensor data which you capture directly at the vehicle sensors. For example, the radar sensors or the camera sensors. That is all data which is captured in step number two at the data acquisition. Then these data is analyzed and upload to, uh, uploaded into a data lake. And this data lake has, if you take the current uh, level two driving functions or assistance functions like uh, emergency brake assist, approximately uh, data worth 1 million kilometers. With this data lake, you are able to do algorithm optimization, model retraining according to your uh, analytics you do in the step three. Then with an optimized algorithm, you start a simulation maybe of single test cases in order to see if the situation improves, which was maybe uh, faulty. And then you start a revalidation of the uh, entire uh, data lake with the 1 million kilometer, which gives you the confidence that you can uh, again deploy your software also into the vehicle fleet without having regression. Looking at that, I can also already give you a clear example where the cloud based solution uh, provided us heavy. Uh, advantages compared to what we are have done so far without the automotive edge platform. So looking at the single steps, um, there is a use case where Continental does not develop the entire sensors and evaluation compute units. So 
as you as it is sketched in this vehicle continental has two of the uh, control units and sensors and we have a third part unit which provides another sensor into this vehicle brand using now this infinite loop of course this third party also uses kind of virtual validation and revalidation and provides again some validation results to us which we again use then in our step four uh, for revalidation of the optimized algorithms to provide such results of external data so far we had to do an upload of data to uh, via exchange portals and that is due to the nature of the data sometimes even uh, significant amounts of data of course then we needed someone from conti to download the data and copy the data into something where the simulation uh, can run again from continental's point of view using the Continental Automotive Edge platform, we have a very easy way to hand over this data from third party. And it's just about granting access to an S3 bucket inside AWS. And we even are able to completely automate the entire workflow. So as soon as we have new data arriving, the pipeline automatically starts and as you can see from the comparison the processing time gets down from days to a quarter of an hour including the entire interaction in order to allow for an easy to start with this kind of architecture transformation continental and uh, with the support of the workbench and cloud of AWS developed the development kits to give you something at hand to start with. A development kit contains a scalable compute platform. That's something which goes into the vehicle. It contains an automotive software stack from our in-house partner for software development, Electrobit. It contains the workbench, which we already talked about, and it contains the cloud-based services from AWS, for example, for the validation and re-simulation aspects we had uh, talked about before. Um, this way, of course, you can directly harmonize development and integration of distributed services and application. You can work with a platform which offers your clear interfaces and uh, a kickstart development environment. And you can already experience the service-oriented ecosystem architectures in the vehicle. So basically, in a nutshell, the Continental Automotive Edge Framework enables faster development. It allows you to interchange building blocks. You can start directly by the fact that all the ecosystem and development uh, workbench is hosted in the cloud. And we have ready to use development kits, which you can directly use a scalable compute platform. The platform itself, which we have for the vehicle is modular and extensible. So if you need additional performance, we have solutions for that. Of course, the building blocks in the vehicle computers themselves, they are automotive grade and designed for use in safety and mixed critical safety systems. Um, we have this integrated tool framework. And of course, we have the cloud as scalable option. And I think with that, 
I'm going to hand over to Torsten in order to continue the presentation of how we came to this Continental Automotive at Framework. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin, for the great overview um, of Continental's view of the market and also Continental's journey so far. When I talk, what I want to talk about now is the project approach, how we together um, uh, set out the project and how um, AWS helped Continental to build the platform. And I want to focus on key aspects of the project, um, lessons learned, um, and some, some insights. Um, we started off with uh, identifying three key areas um, for the project. Um, on the one hand side, skills and ownership. Having the right skills for the platform and for the, uh, for the pilot project in the team, identifying builders that take ownership and that also um, recognize their duty to look left and right and see what other capabilities they can provide. Security is job zero. Everyone is responsible to secure the platform and to deliver the project in a secured fashion. But in addition to that, we also engage security leads that have a specific look at the security architecture and make sure that the platform itself is secured. We ran trainings and hackathons to enable the team and get the right skills into the project. We also looked at expert integration, finding experts from the field, from the projects that know about the tooling, that know about the methodology, that have deep level expertise in the relevant fields, and we needed to plug them into the project to build the platform um, streamlined and in time. Last but not least, we had a pilot project. This pilot project helped us to prioritize finding the right um, activities, setting the right uh, focus, and then also being able to run initial test cycles and provide feedback into the project. We delivered blueprints for the platform, but also for the project in a parallel fashion. This enabled us to deliver the project and the platform in six months time, capturing the inputs from the experts and building on the skills and ownership from the team. In addition, we identified what enabling capabilities we need to bring in. On the one hand side, we have AWS Identity and Access Management that helped us to build the multi-tenant environment and secure access on the platform. In addition, Amazon managed workflows for Apache Airflow, drive the workflows that are being put onto the platform, provide consistent and, uh, and clear monitoring of the execution and early feedback of the success or not success. Amazon Elastic Container Services to run simulations, to run workloads in a scalable fashion across multiple regions and an elastic file system to provide the backing storage uh, to provide uh, computation with the right data. Next, I want to touch on how we got the skills into the team. Uh, we identified the core stack, the core technology that is required um, to deliver the project and mapped the initial solution stacks to AWS services and to the skills required from the team. We ensured that service know-how for security as an example for multi-tenancy, for scale, talking about compute and storage, um, and regional extensions is available in the project to deliver. Each team had a Scrum Master, Tech Lead, Engineers and Testers integrated in one team uh, to deliver the project and their work stream. Each of these components that you see here uh, was essential for us to build on and to accelerate the delivery of the platform and also the pilot project. The AWS landing zone provides the capability to run multiple projects at the same time in a secure and separated fashion. Each of these capabilities that we put in place and the skills required to build them was essential for us to deliver the project. A key aspect at the beginning of the project was to support with de-risking and acceleration. And for that, one of the biggest lessons learned that we had was to, uh, to build up a hackathon. That hackathon was set out to run a full week um, across uh, more than 50 participants. The objective of the hackathon was to de-risk critical components and build first prototypes to show how the solution will work and get first insights and feedback loops. 
We also wanted to establish the team in an agile with their agile ceremonies, having uh, velocity data at hand to see how quickly we can move. Early outcomes, as an example, POCs or uh, MVPs, allowed us to provide early tests and test results back to the team, back to the customers, and to see where we need to adjust. The approach to deliver this hackathon was that we prepared for two weeks, identifying key risk areas um, and critical functions that we wanted to test, set out the right dependencies, um, made sure that we have the right team in place, organized the trainings, the kickoff, the closing, and also, of course, inform our stakeholders. We invited specialists that we later require for the project to already take part in this hackathon to provide their insights and expertise early on in the project. The execution of uh, the hackathon was a five-day workshop where we invited uh, in a remote setting uh, all necessary participants to then um, orchestrate and organize themselves into smaller working groups. The outcome of the hackathon was that over the five, five days with 50 participants, we worked in four different work streams, de-risking core elements of the platform around simulation, tooling, and we gathered initial performance data. Performance data for uh, running simulations themselves, but also for the team and how fast the team can go. Ingestion of test data was successfully completed and allowed us to do a first run of the components within the first week. The team established a, a customer satisfaction score of 4.5 across the entire team to record where we need to go better or where we need to improve for the next hackathon. Now last, I want to talk about lessons learned for operations and maintenance. We established these as a critical component early on in the project. The earlier we start with continuous operation optimization and, uh, and insights, the better we can tune and we can optimize the platform later on. Game days help us to find um, processes, to optimize processes for events that are unexpected. We need to train for the unexpected. Game days and security incidents training are essential to operate the platform. We establish continuous operations optimizations using Trusted Advisor, Cost Explorer, and of course, user feedback. Coming back to our first initial setup, we wanted to hear feedback early on and continuously. We also built dashboards to optimize insights and provide actionable alarms to optimize operations and also gather feedback for the next iterations of, of development. Next, we're going to look for blueprints for projects. These will allow developers to build their own blueprints on the platform. Developer documentation is essential for that. So we're going to have developer documentation to drive self-service blueprints and self-service runbooks for custom simulations or workflows. It will also allow for integration with ISV products or separate tooling that needs to be integrated uh, to support DevOps. Rapid onboarding guides and quick starts will allow developers and projects to build their own automation in an accelerated fashion. This will allow a reduction of onboarding time and provide a great user experience for the simulation and for the development teams. Thank you very much for taking the time today. I um, hope you had some good insights into how we, um, how we developed the platform. Um, if you want to reach out to us, please contact us on LinkedIn. Thank you very much.